Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. There have been about 370 of them now, and so if this is new to you, you might want to go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu where you'll see all the previous ones archived and organized in several different ways. Um, this show is made possible by the support of appreciative viewers and listeners, so if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it to any degree, there's a donate button on the site, and we really appreciate the support that we receive. My guest today is Harry Alto. Um, I'm breaking precedent here and interviewing Harry for a third time, <laughs> with apologies to those who have been out hoping for a second interview or even a first one. Um, but I've, I've known Harry for a long time, about 20 years, and over the course of that time we've had probably hundreds of conversations. Um, and I think he's a very interesting guy. Um, Harry has just written a book, which is part of the reason we're having this interview now, and um, why don't you just hold it up for a second. There you go. It's cool. Uh, excuse these things here. They're, yeah. they're just notes. <laughs> Can't see it too well in the in this camera shot, but it's uh, called Landscape of Enlightenment, right? The yeah. Landscape of Enlightenment with doors. Doors and windows to the world. Right. Yeah. And we'll be, maybe be explaining we'll make some, why you yeah. called it that. Um, now, I there's two ways of looking at Harry or understanding him. Um, <laughs> either he's some kind of freak of nature. I'm a freak of nature. <laughs> yeah. I, I can buy that. Who has kind of remarkable experiences, which um, other people probably won't ever have and shouldn't expect to have. And if they're looking for those things as earmarks of enlightenment, then they're going to wait forever because they're not going to have those kinds of experiences. Or um, Harry is kind of a trailblazer. He's He's someone who in his teens and twenties was having the sort of level of experience that many of today's contemporary teachers are now having and talking about. I like your second you like the one second better. One? Yeah, yeah, much better. <laughs> you could get a t-shirt that says Freak of Nature that, on it. Well, right around oh, town. I don't know. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he's, you know, now 40 or 50 years have passed since he was having that level of experience and he's uh, unfolded a lot more detail. And indeed, I mean, some of the people I interview um, say that in their experience so far, this just seems to be an ever unfolding thing and they don't know what's, what they're going to be experiencing 10 or 20 years from now. Uh, there are other people I've interviewed who say, well, yeah, I went through a phase where I was uh, exploring all these subtle worlds and having all this flashy stuff and that eventually went away and uh, I feel like it was an interesting exploration but I don't consider it uh, essential or uh, to what the awakened person experiences, and I'm happy to be without it. So we're going to talk about these kinds of considerations in, in this interview and a, a whole lot of other things. Um, maybe we should just start with that one, and in, in the process of responding to that, um, you know, maybe you could give us a definition of what you understand enlightenment to be. Well, thank you for having me again. Mm -hmm. uh, that's great. And you know, Rick, Rick is, you know, I'm kind of relatively quiet kind of guy. Well, you won't know that from the amount I talk, but um, he's, the, he's the fellow who kind of encouraged me to start talking about it and almost come out of the closet, as it were, with this stuff, you know, because I was very shy about it for years, and, and I, I did start talking about it a few years ago, what, four or five years ago, and, and uh, lots of people have said they appreciate it, they get something from it. And that brings up an interesting point for me, and you asked, what is enlightenment? I don't consider it, it's not a state, because it, it's more like a reality. Do you know the difference? One is a, one is a natural event, it's, it's just there, mm -hmm. and you realize when you go through these stages, or when I've gone through these stages, many, many stages, and we can get into that a little bit, um, it's all, I've always then kind of looked back on my life and said, well, what changed? I had it at a lesser degree before. Now I have it in a clearer degree, and it, there was a transformation that took place, and suddenly I have a wider perspective, feel better, and things like that, and, and then move on. <laughs> and that's happened, I'd say, 
seven to ten times in my life. Hmm. Major shifts. Major shifts, seven, seven, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, here, if I can make a point about, you know, kind of the experience of enlightenment and the knowingness of enlightenment or the knowledge of enlightenment, they're not different. Now, well, you know, I was, I was trying to think of a, an analogy that's a little different and I'd say, let's say somebody has a diamond in the closet somewhere. It's hidden away and it's full of dusty, it's raw, right? And they clean the closet once a week and a little bit of the dust wipes off and eventually they see it's kind of shiny. They bring it out and they say, what is this? And they put it on somewhere else and it's been hidden all these years, but it's been in your life, it's in your home. And eventually, <clears throat> Somebody might come along, maybe some teacher or somebody with good experience. Whoa, that that's worth a lot of money, mm -hmm. and and you and you say, whoa, is it? <laughs> maybe I should start thinking about this and understanding what I have, and so understanding has that relationship to experience that they're very close. The the awake experience. I prefer the word awake because enlightenment sounds odd. To Grandiose me. or something. Yeah, and it's yeah. not. Yeah. Flashy experiences can come, not come, doesn't matter. What's in between your experiences is this uh, uh, field of consciousness that's unbounded and that's great. Everybody has that. Some people are aware of it more, some people less. Everybody has consciousness. You have a little bit of it or you have a lot of it. It's not that you don't have a lot of it, it's that you're not aware of it. That's the difference, right? Everybody has the same amount. They have the same amount of Ultimately, potential. Ultimately, intrinsically, Potent yeah, potentially. yeah, potentially. So, um, I think we can pursue this whole thing about how to, you know, the understanding of experience and experience itself. I, I consider them equal, and eventually they join in their one experience, mm -hmm. one knowingness. And, um, you know, there's many questions to come up. So, you mentioned seven to ten significant shifts. Was there for you ever a defining moment that you would say tr marked the transition into the awakened state, if you want to use that phrase? Well, since you asked me to, t you know, let the cat out of the bag completely on this interview, so I will. It started, my first transition was four or five years, years old, old and, mm -hmm. and I had an experience, boom, um, where I won't, I won't relate it because I've done it at other Interviews. interviews, but um, I suddenly realized, I was four years old, that there's, there's a field of consciousness. I didn't have the ability to think about it, but I saw it and felt it. It was separate from me, but it was everywhere, all around me. Mm -hmm. And since that time, believe it or not, I started thinking about what the heck is that? Right? What the, uh -huh. And that was my first one. Mm -hmm. What the heck is this? this field of light or consciousness or knowingness or whatever it was. It wasn't knowingness at that stage. It was more like a sight. Mm -hmm. I saw something. But it was always there. And I don't know that it ever went away. And then in my teens I had another kind of awakening when I, when this, this um, <clears throat> call it a field of consciousness, kind of moved into my body and my body and the consciousness felt similar. And so I said, what the heck is this? <laughs> Right? What the heck is this? It was very natural, very normal. And, and as I speak about uh, these experiences, Rick was completely right in saying, nobody has to have what I have, and I don't have to have what other people have. There's a similarity to the experience of the awakened mind, but we're all totally different. Imagine for a moment if this will never happen, but let's say 10 enlightened people walked into this room right now, they're standing right How about there. into a bar? 10 enlightened people and, walk into a bar. And they all sit down <laughs> and you're looking at them. And uh, oh, you reminded me of a joke, you know, I was born in Finland, a uh -huh. Finnish joke about, about a bar, you want to hear sure. it? <laughs> this is the typical <laughs> Finnish person, two, two middle-aged or older Finns go to a bar, they've known each other for 20 years, they've, be, they've been sitting there drinking for two or three hours and one, one turns to the other and says, uh, uh, so how's everything with you? And the other guy turns to him and says, did we come here to talk or drink? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's probably the first joke I've ever said, sort of publicly. But you know, there's a certain, all my Finnish relatives, they're not 
my brother, they don't talk much, right. you know, they're very quiet. It's a finished thing. Yeah, it's a finished yeah. thing. I, I tend to, I'm very out. Yeah, once you get going. <laughs> I can get going. Uh, where was I before? We were talking about, uh, was there a defining moment for you? Okay, so. Um, it sounds like there's been a number of defining moments. There's no one defining moment that you could say that was it. The moment I had a defining moment at any time in my life, I was on going forward, wanted to go. You know. So you'd have one and you think, but that's not the end of it. Yes. Right. But I know that wasn't the end of it because I don't want to make any claims, but let's say, let's say, for instance, if my mind was away, you'd see a little bit where you're going and you're seeing a little bit where you come from. Mm -hmm. So there's never a wall here or a wall here. It's all kind of in the present and you, you're, okay, I'm going to go there now. I'm going to yeah. move forward, right? Yeah. And, you know, and that went on, say, let's say in my early 20s. So some people are going to hear that and they're going to say, well, isn't enlightenment a kind of a final resting place where you just can okay. chill and, and you're, ne you're, never, you're, you're no longer chasing the dangling carrot of something more? I'll get to that. Okay. We've talked about that in previous interviews too, but it's... Yes. Yeah. And, and that's completely true. Yeah. And it's true inside. And, and then eventually with time, it's, it's a uh, see-through kind of experience where you see consciousness from the inside to the outside. And, and you know... You might know you've made it, and you know you've made it, but that doesn't mean you don't get to know more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, talk about the ups and downs of life and transitional periods in the country or in individual life, those continue. But they're now, if your mind is awake, they're in, they're in relation to something much bigger, some fullness, some integration, some very quiet happiness inside. Even if you're going through this kind of up and down and up and down. So. Around about the age of uh, 21, I started to have an intellect <laughs> and be able to think a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And now I could recognize that, you know, I still did not recognize there was any difference between me or anybody else, and I don't feel there's any difference between me and anybody else even now. I look at Rick, and Rick looks and acts and talks just no different than me. That's how I feel. So at about age 20, this, um, this kind of uh, pure consciousness that I had inside kind of became very bright. I stopped sleeping in the normal sense. Um, you maintained I, pure awareness during I sleep? I maintained many different kinds of pure awareness from almost dim, dark to light, but I was awake, yeah. always awake. And I know in the morning, wait a minute, I didn't sleep. <laughs> Even if it was dark, I wasn't asleep. If it was light, I w if I was dreaming, whatever was deep sleep, I was aware that the night passed and I was awake in the morning. I almost felt like I fell asleep when I woke up. Yeah. Because suddenly I couldn't see through that wall, whereas in the dream state you can do anything, go anywhere, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Um, but in any case, so that became very permanent. And I'd say, if I was to say, it was there a moment when um, that was kind of a complete transition where it never went back, I'd say around about 20. Mm. That's, when, that's when that happened, never went away, it's always there. But my life went up and down like a teeter-totter, like everybody's life. Sure. Still does a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, um, but as I said, experience of the relative is in, is in relation to something bigger now. I, I'd like to kind of make a comment about I consider myself extremely normal. I go through all the stuff everybody goes through, and even though I'm going to get into some fancy experiences, my life is like anybody else's life. And I'd like to point out that even though I have, have and will continue to have, and have even at this moment, experience when I put it into words sound extremely flashy, they're not flashy to me. Hey, because you're accustomed. No. You're it's acclimated. more than I'm acclimated, but I'm more than accustomed. Okay, I'm sitting in this room. I can describe those whatever's over there, that wall, the pictures, the ceiling, and I instantly know that's a ceiling. It keeps the rain out. You just know that just by looking at it, because mm -hmm. you've lived your life. Well, that's pretty ordinary stuff. Ordinary stuff. So when you have an inner experience like that, and you have it a long time, it becomes ordinary. Yeah. But not ordinary in the sense that it goes away and you don't like it. Ordinary in the sense that it's quiet and expected and, and acknowledged and known. Yeah, so you're saying that 
you know, you might be experiencing a lot more going on in this room than the average person, but it's as ordinary to you as the ordinary experience of the room is to you, yes, to yes. you or to anyone. It's a sight and a sound and a touch and a taste, just like a regular life. Yeah. And I'd, I'd like to say that I think not only does everybody have this potential, I think it, everybody has a taste of what I'm talking about, but we're conditioned not to accept it, think about it, know it, acknowledge it, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And even divine experiences, I find exactly the same as pure unboundedness or the relative. They're all, they're all the same, one continuum yeah. of experience. And I think almost everybody, if not everybody, you know, I don't even like the word potential because to me, I think that's what everybody experiences, but there's, there's a lack of understanding about it. You've, you forgot who you are. You forgot it. Yeah. I don't know. Well, well comment on that. You know, there, you, there's a few things I could it. say. I mean, one is we'll have to elaborate on what we mean by divine experiences. We'll get into that. Um, but what, you're, what it implies is there's a lot of potential for subtle perception that people don't ordinarily have. I mean, you, you, will, you experience angels and devas and things like that. The average person does not, or are you saying that the average person actually does, but doesn't even recognize that they're picking up on something of that nature? So let me. Will you finish? Okay. Oh, I'll, more later. But okay. Go ahead. So let's say, let's uh, let me describe pure consciousness for a moment, and then I, from that I'll describe something else. So pure consciousness is 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 a kind of, in, you can call it an inside experience because that's how it starts. It's kind of abstract, it's whole, it, it, it's not even in it, it's more like uh, uh, impersonal, unbounded consciousness that everybody has, most people don't know they have it, but everybody has. And over time you're going in it through meditation or prayer or whatever technique you're using, you go inside, come out, go inside, come out, you get habituated, you begin to see a little bit. What you begin to see is there's it's different for everybody. Some people see light, some people see a shimmer, some movement in that consciousness. Silence first, and then it, you start seeing some shimmer, you start seeing uh, something. But when, even that, what you're referring to, is something that, um, even that preliminary familiarity with pure consciousness is something that only a tiny fraction of humanity actually has. Most people are completely preoccupied with other things. Yes, but, but I'm generally talking to a spiritual and crowd. A spiritual crowd, okay. that's what I'm saying, sure. who have been seeking and wanting meditating and knowing and, and meditating yeah, yeah. and whatever anybody's doing. That's a different crowd than... Than your basic NASCAR audience. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. I hope and I know that's true. Yeah. Okay, so this shimmer or this even sight, even... And most people, you know, I over the years I've talked to a bunch of people, quite a lot of people in the last few years, and. And they all say, well, I don't see anything. And then I say, what? How do you describe it to me then? How do you describe this experience? If you say, oh, is that inner sight? Yeah, that's inner sight. Uh -huh. You're seeing pure consciousness. You're, you ha or you have a sense of it. Yeah. And if you have a sense of it, you're seeing it. Now, to me, if, if I look back on my beginning experience, that inner sight is the beginning of divine perception. Mm -hmm. It's already divine. I would, I would don't differentiate between that shimmer, that sight, that what, however you're experiencing pure consciousness and a little bit of movement in it or something in it, that something in it is the divine moving. Mm -hmm. But you're not recognizing it or saying it's anything more than a little shimmer. Yeah. That's all. So like what that. we're saying here okay. is that, um, you know, experiences of the divine, or probably of anything, can start out uh, in a sort of a fledgling state. They do uh, start out that way. Yeah, yes. pr very preliminary, and but there are subtle hints if one is attentive to All them the that, that will become more clear as time goes on. And also, a little while ago, you alluded to the importance of understanding as being yes. as, as important to experience as experience. And I just want to make one little comment, which is that I feel like um, I with I feel an impulse as I do this show. I feel like it has a mission. And part of its mission, I think, is to help to um, help to help the sort of collective spiritual community gain a better understanding of 
um, what enlightenment actually is, what the, what awakening actually is. I, I, I don't remember whether we talked this in a previous interview, but I mentioned it in some other ones. It's as if, you know, comparing uh, explorers of North America and Lewis and Clark had a certain vague understanding of what the territory might be and they ventured west and they got a better understanding as they went along. It was quite mm -hmm. unlike what they thought it was going to be. And But jump ahead to today and we have every single square foot mapped out, you know, with GPS and everything. So as a society we have a much better understanding of the territory. That's right. I think there's something really valuable for the spiritual community in um, and for the world at large in, in understanding what the possibilities are for spiritual enfoldment and um, and it's, it, it's, it almost cubbyholes it even to sp say spiritual because we're really just talking about understanding how the, how the world works, how, what the reality is. And um, it would be both an inspiration to people and it would be a safeguard because it would prevent people from mistaking something which actually was kind of off the mark for what they were really looking for. It brings up a good point, a very good point, is that if you have an experience and it goes away, then it's not the awakened state. So you have a flashy experience, right? Mm -hmm. But it goes away. And then you say, oh, I'm enlightened now. But if it went away... Then you're not. You're not. Right. So what doesn't go away? Now, now this is a very subtle point because eventually nothing goes away, but at first you know, you're, let's say you're meditating, you go inside, you have an experience of pure consciousness, mm -hmm. and then you wake up, and you, or you get up from your chair or wherever, you go for a walk, and you forget it. Mm -hmm. Remember that you just forgot it. It didn't go away. You went away. It mm -hmm. didn't go away. Pure consciousness didn't go anywhere. You went somewhere else. <laughs> so you won't go for a walk, then you meditate again, or prayer, or whatever you do. Go inside, have the experience again. Oh, there it is. Whoa. Yeah. It, and then you get up, and you do that enough times, then you get up at some point and you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, that didn't go away. Wait a minute, I didn't go away. Mm. I remember it now. <laughs> yeah, which is not to say, I mean, you've relayed some pretty amazing experiences, flashy experiences, and we, anybody who's meditating for a long time has had some. Um, so it's not to say that you're always going to be having that kind of thing 24 hours a day, but rather I, I think you kind of extract the essence of it. Um, and wh whatever lesson is meant to be learned from a particular experience or whatever unfoldment has taken place from a particular experience, that becomes stable and, um, and, and normal in, in your experience. That's but, exactly right. But initially, when an, an experience like that dawns, it may seem like fireworks. That can, often can be fireworks. Yeah. But you've interviewed so many people, and some people say it is, and some people say it isn't fireworks, yeah. these awakenings, right? And I, I guess I would say they're both fireworks and not fireworks, but... So, so we're starting at pure consciousness, so you have this experience of pure consciousness. Over time it becomes, you can say permanent, it's always there. Um, you may not be quite as aware of it in activity as you are in your meditation, but it's there. You kind of sense that pure consciousness has uh, become a permanent reality. Uh, maybe you feel separate from it or something, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's not something you really relate to, but you wonder what it is. So around about 25, I, I had meditated. I started at about 25 or 26. I started TM, mm -hmm. Maharishi's meditation. and. Um, and I read some books and some, I got some understanding. I already had the experience of pure consciousness. It was there 24 hours a day. I'd been there for a number of years. I didn't really know what it was, but I knew it was there. It was clear enough. It wasn't so faint that I didn't know. When I started meditating and then started reading about what I'm experiencing, I said, whoa, what are they saying? <laughs> um, this doesn't feel like enlightenment to me. This, fe this felt like this is what everybody has. This is, this is the normal state of... Or so you thought. Or so I thought. Yeah. But I haven't changed my mind. I haven't changed my mind. I think, I think the state of wakefulness is the, uh, is the normal state. It's what everybody deserves. It's what everybody is inside. It's if 
what everybody is outside. It's, but there's there's a lack of knowledge about it. Yeah. Lots of understanding missing. But that's like saying, okay, let's say everybody in the United States has a bank account that has a million dollars in it, uh, but only a handful of people know it and actually go to the bank and withdraw money and get to use it. Um, so the people who don't know it, who are living under bridges and begging on street corners, it doesn't really do them any good that they have That's this true. bank account. Okay, but this reminds me of the analogy that I was going to tell you about the 10, ten people until I got distracted with the bar joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so l let me just say it my way. It's easier for me. Let's say here we are, and we've been, we, for some, this could never happen, but let's say 10 enlightened people walked into this room and you're looking at them, they're standing in front of us right mm -hmm. here. And they all look totally different. They're dressed different. There's ladies there, there's men there, there's young people, old people. Total mixture of people. Some have beards, some don't. All totally different. You ask the first one, they know that they know they have something. And they know why they're here. So what's your experience? And and the lady says, Well, you know, I don't talk about it. I I have a, I'm, I'm very happy. That's all she says. The next guy says, "Well, well, you know, I, you know, I, I think about it. So, you know, it, it looks like it's something. It's a little bit separate from me, but it seems to be a support to my life." Third person says more. Fourth person starts describing. Yeah, it, it's got all kinds of qualities to it. Yes, there's this silence, but there's all kinds of qualities. They seem to be there too. I can't describe them. I don't know what they are. They're nice. Then you go on and on and on. You go to the tenth person. The tenth person says, uh, starts talking nonstop, writing books, whatever, and uh, and 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 sees all kinds of texture, sight, even divine experiences. Now, what connects all these ten people isn't these changes that are going in. There's an underlying similarity to their experience. It's, that's, that's the awake state or the awake, awakened mind. And the awakened mind knows itself and says, I'm here. Now, if you were to meet these same 10 people 10 years later, 20 years later, the first person may still not be saying very much. But the, 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 the person at the other end will for sure start saying, well, you know, I had this state, and then this state, and then this state, and then this state. Well, why wouldn't the first person be saying very much 10 because years later? Because they're not later? talkative. Just because they're not talkative, but in terms of their actual experience, would it, that if, have evolved? If, would number one have, have evolved to the number 10's experience? If just having, yes, but having said that, that first person might be very heart-oriented, mm -hmm. doesn't care about the intellect, yeah. and all at once to say, I am, I, I am so, you know, on the feeling level, and that's where I want to stay. Mm -hmm. I love it, I love it. I see God, this and that, but I don't talk about it. Yeah. This other person who has a very active intellect will describe all these layers, and, but they'll also say that I love this experience, it's wonderful, that's why I talk about it. All right, so some people <laughs> might be more intellectual, some more emotional or yeah, heart-oriented, yeah. some might um, be more visual, some more auditory. We all, we're all wired differently. and. Um, I, I guess uh, you know some some might question whether enlightenment or any of these higher states or anything uh, even have any objective reality or whether they're just uh, various subjective conditions. I mean, there are people who, for instance, who question the NDE experience, near-death experience. They say it's just the brain getting starved of oxygen, uh, and that there's no uh, they're actually they're, p these people aren't experiencing anything that's objectively real. Um, I think what you and I would say is that you know. There, there is a reality to the, to the universe, and we all are equipped to explore it in different ways. But we're not exploring different universes. Um, you know, some of us, well, like in science, all the scientists are exploring the same universe. But some are chemists, and some are physicists, and some are biologists, and so on. They, they've chosen to specialize according to their particular tendencies and aptitudes to investigate a particular aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But um, you can add to this, but it seems to me that there, there's going to be something a little different there with enlightenment because, or awake, the awakened state, in that there's a common denominator among all the people, regardless of how individually they, their experience unfolds. They, there must be something essential that they all share. Would you say that? They share this unbounded silence that's awake within itself and that is actually 
very quietly delightful. Mm -hmm. That's why you go for it. Right. Now, you don't get that in, uh, let's call it regular life. Right. You buy a car and it's, it's a Porsche or something and you drive it for a few days and you know, now it's just a Porsche. And you can drive it and that guy has a Volkswagen or something and you feel good for a moment, but that's it, that moment. Everybody's looking for more and more and more and more. Most people think it's in, you know, buying stuff, doing stuff, <clears throat> and to a certain degree it is. Now, if your mind or, and your heart has this experience of, let's call it contentment inside, then you buy a Porsche. Your feeling of con uh, uh, enjoying the Porsche doesn't go away as much, okay, uh -huh. nor any other experience because it's in relation to something that has, doesn't change from moment to moment. Okay, so a sad, um, a sad guy with an awake mind is sad. Uh, a non-awake guy who's sad, he's also sad. They're both sad. But What's the difference? Yeah. This guy who's awake also has the experience of this unbounded field of contentment inside in relation to the sadness. And mm -hmm. we'll get into what happens, in the mechanics of that uh, uh, experience later, but he, you know, the awake man could even be more sad, but it's still sure. in relation to a much bigger phenomenon. Sure, I mean, the, the awake guy, his daughter might have died, and, and the unawake guy, he might have, you know, not won the lottery or something, so he's like bummed, but, uh, but, but what you're saying is that the, the sort of the, the depth of contentment and the fullness of contentment in the awake person uh, mitigates um, whatever waves there are on the surface of life. It mitigated, mitigates it to the, to the extent that now you can still function and you can help these, the situation that might need help. You're not overshadowed or overburdened by the sadness, even though it's there and you're feeling it. You'll, you know, if some tragic thing happens in your life, of course you're going to feel it, just yeah. like anybody else. But it won't. It won't nail you to the wall, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. all. And that's a big deal. I mean, the, it's a very big the, deal. the various scriptures talk about equanimity and how that's characteristic of the awakened state. And um, if you don't have that anchor or that foundation, it's hard to have equanimity because you're tossed about. You know, this, all you have is, is your small relative losses and gains or big ones. You don't have any, anything permanent to, to be. Um, you know, established in. So, you want to get into some of that stuff? Well, you know, get back to my book here. You know, okay. I, I thought I wrote, wrote a, you know, well, it's yet to be proven because it's only been out for 10 days, mm -hmm. but very good response so far. It's even making some bestseller lists and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but what I tried to do in this book is not just give my, it, all my flashes in here. Every single angel I've ever seen is in there, okay? <laughs> However, there's also stories from my childhood and even when I was a young adult and all the, I almost said dumb things that I did, but yes. Yeah, like riding that log <laughs> yeah, into a lake. Yes, and <laughs> what, I'm, I'm, what I'm showing and, and pointing out that Everybody goes through this. It doesn't matter. You, you, uh, wakefulness doesn't make you special in the sense that you won't do those dumb things when you're young. It, and I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. I think it might be somewhat of a protective thing. No. I mean, because there's a lot of young people who do really dumb things. You yeah, know, but I, I'm talking end about up kind dying of dying as a result or going to jail as a well, result. Well, I, I don't mean on that level. Yeah. You know, like more like mischievous and taking risks and, yeah, yeah. you know, um, okay, so, so we come to earth, you know, wherever we were before that, now we're on earth. The way that I look at it, that all the experiences in my life, you know, all the little hurdles I've had to jump over and everybody has to jump over these ups and downs, they have a reason, they have a purpose and the purpose to jump over these uh, uh, little fences, these challenges, is that the next time you jump over the next fence and the next one, that pure consciousness is more stable. Mm. So yeah. it gets challenged, goes away, gets challenged, goes away, gets challenged, until it doesn't go away. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, That's if, what we, I'm, if we I'm lived in to... some kind of protective bubble, then maybe we'd maintain pure consciousness, but, but it would be, you know, subject to the slightest 
as soon as she came out of the bubble, yeah. it would go away. Right. Yeah. In fact, I mean, there are stories of yogis living in the Himalayas and growing up in ashrams, and then they decide to become gurus and come to the West. <laughs> and they, they're hit with all these temptations and challenges and stuff that they weren't really equipped to deal with. And the, you know. Okay, so let me, I'm going to read a little sure. thing. It's only for a moment. Mm -hmm. And I'll take that out. I no longer need that one. So, Normal Life, that's the head of this title. Enlightenment is a walking, talking, everyday living kind of affair. It is known through the living of normal events. It's a delightful, li lively, overall space and stillness in which the mind knows, the heart feels, the senses flow, and the body moves. When gained, it is never lost. Even our body and its environment reside in the knowledge makeup of pure experience and, pure, and the pure sight of consciousness not to mention family, friends, and society. Every fiber in our body, every atom, every molecule, every organic structure, every feeling, and every thought is a mirror image of infinite connectedness, connectedness to the universe, universal values from which they arise. This collective, collective experience of knowingness that is first abstract and over time becomes more and more tangible is always a harmonious addition to our daily lives, which of course continue as before on their own enhanced level. So that's that's what I've been saying. You know, it's not everybody's moving towards the awake state. Everybody's moving. Everybody. Every single thing and every single human being on earth is moving towards that and seeking it in different ways. Most of the people in these so called spiritual Paths are seeking it from, you know, in the right way through meditation, through prayer, uh, through activity, whatever they're doing, right? And they gain it to whatever degree they can gain. My particular angle on gaining enlightenment, you know, there's lots of techniques, there's lots of programs, Buddhist programs, Hindu programs, um, meditation programs, spiritual, you know, all kinds of techniques that come throughout time to help us on the path. My angle is that what's, what's missing, because most people who do processes, do techniques, do meditation, they have some experience, maybe a little bit, maybe a lot, but often what's really missing, they don't get it. They don't get what they're experiencing, even if they have a clear experience. They don't get it. They don't understand it. Now, intrinsic to the experience of an uh, 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 expanded consciousness, inside that experience is the is the knowledge or the knowingness of that experience. But you have to kind of think about it, look at it, and talk about it, be around people who have those experiences, and and then, well, like you, you've been listening to, you know, uh, people like me for what a decade now, right? Well, counting this show has been going on six or seven years. But, yeah, so uh, hundreds of people. For about 50 years before this, I've been interested in this stuff. <laughs> yeah, but you have to recognize what you're doing, not, not just have, hey, I have this inner experience. Hmm. In my sense, I, I have this inner experience. I want to know what it is. Yeah. And what, what's, what's coming forward? This desire to go forward is part of the experience. I want more. I want more. And um, that's what I try to convey in my book. And I think I do. Good. All righty. Um, well, I don't have any questions about that. You want to read another passage? Yeah. So here I am. Let's say I'm 25 years old. I've got this. Um... Oh, I do have a question. Okay. Um, before I forget it. Okay. Um, a friend of mine, you know, who's watched your previous interviews, who was wondering if you had ever gone through any kind of a dark night of the soul type of thing. And, you know, in, in your previous interview, you talked about that thing on the course where you were, you lost your self-awareness. That wasn't for, very long. For though, like so 15 I'm minutes or yeah, something. Yeah. But aside from that, um, was there ever any kind of a, a dark and troubled and difficult time, or has it pretty much been a smooth ride for you? You know, I've never talked about that side. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I'll give it a minute. Okay, yeah. and I will. Yes, when I was uh, before I started meditating, and I started having this experience of um, pure consciousness, unbounded consciousness, and it was separate from me. Mm. Um, 
I, I, was in, I was still in college. I wasn't particularly happy because I didn't like an experience. I didn't like the experience. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. Uh, I was doing well in school and this and that. Were you maintaining awareness during sleep at that stage? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know, the first experience can be uh, dramatic. Yeah, and you've heard that from people too. Mm -hmm. And um, I went through a lot of challenges for about two years. Mm. Uh, mental challenges, not physical. Right. It's a healthy dude, but uh, it's very difficult for me to talk about that other than to say I, I had a very challenging time for two years. And then when I started meditating, doing TM, it disappeared overnight, yeah. all of that stuff. So you could define, um, you could define the awake mind by what it's not too, right? What isn't, what isn't it? Well, it's not, it's not, it's not asleep, <laughs> you could say, because you know something, you intrinsically feel awake. Well, what is that wakefulness? And you don't ever feel that deep, dark uh, void, as it were, the nothingness feeling, or where am I going? Mm -hmm. That's gone. Yeah. All that disappears. The seeker doesn't disappear. The seeker kind of moves into the... Um, into the pure consciousness and wants to know more, in, in my case, in any case, mm. if you can say it that way. Yeah. So what I hear you saying is that actually you were self-realized but didn't know it, and it was troubling because the knowledge wasn't there to put the thing in context. You got Kind of like Suzanne, Suzanne Siegel, who wrote that book, Collision with the Infinite, where she had this, you know, awakening, and she didn't know what the heck it was, and she was just, you know, terrified for about 10 years until the knowledge finally came that it was a, a good thing that it happened. So she, you know, so what, what that says is that, you know, even the, the state of liberation or, or some stage of enlightenment can be a source of confusion, fear, depression, discomfort, if we don't have the knowledge to supplement it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And understanding is intrinsic, valuable, and totally part of the experience of the awake mind and heart. Mm -hmm. Whether you're heart oriented and you're totally, you know, emotionally oriented, you still have to understand your experience. Yeah. So I guess, you know, I'll, you'll read another passage now, but uh, just to reiterate the point and emphasize it, um, in, in enlightenment or awakening is, is not just about experience, it's about experience and understanding both. Like you, yes, you need absolutely. both legs to walk. Okay. <laughs> so. I'll, I'll just go on to the diverge a little bit here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an artist, always been an artist, right? And I have, there's some pictures in the book. You know, they're in black and white, so, you know, you can't see much, but you can see something. Um, but the artistic process is kind of, you know, this is, I'm not just talking about an artist, but everybody has the same thing. If I'm doing a work of art, Here's a picture. Oh, whoa. You're going to show that picture? <laughs> this is a, we were going to um, put this on the wall, but there was too much glare and it was too big and everything. But this is a, a picture that Harry did. <laughs> well, I didn't expect you to show that. <laughs> sure. Why not? Well, yeah. Well, you know, that picture is, is sort, of, sort of shows these layers of experience, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Mm -hmm. But I was going to talk more about what the, when I'm doing a work of art, because, because consciousness is there, pure consciousness is there, it, this is slightly funny to say it this way, but I feel like I'm plagiarizing myself or <laughs> copying my own consciousness because I can see what I'm painting. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I have a... You have a passage about that. Well, no, I have a picture of what, what I see. I don't think that'll show up very well on okay. camera, but we can paste it in later. Yeah, well, I see the kind of... The, when, when I'm having a thought, about doing a painting, so I have an inner vision, mm -hmm. but I see it almost like a linear map. It's all a bunch of lines. Oh yeah, all those Vol a whole yeah. bunch of lines, and it tells like an architect's drawing or making, you know, a blueprint of a building. He mm -hmm. draws all the lines, and he says plumbing's there, door there, window there. I see it just like that, sort of a bunch of lines that tell me you're going to put color there, you're going to put yeah. a person there, you're going to put one level there, one. And so, and I look at it, and I can see it, in one, and then I start tracing it mm -hmm. on the on the canvas or the paper and I'm, I'm just watching my hand doing it 
<laughs> I think Michelangelo used to say that he, he, you know, he when he carved the David, for instance, that he saw that in the block of marble and just chipped away everything that wasn't that or something. You know, he had that vision. And I totally relate to that, but I don't compare myself to him. No, <laughs> okay, not, not suggesting that. <laughs> yeah, right. and um, but the artistic process. It took me a long time from the time I started meditating until that ex that process that I see when I'm doing art. It's just my normal process, mm -hmm. whether I'm moving or walking down the street. Now it's the same way hmm. as just seeing the, the body moving in this uh, more expanded space for now. Yeah. Okay. What do you want to talk about? Do you want to hear a poem? Nobody likes poems, but I, I only put a limited number of them in there. But you know, one great thing about poetry for the guy who writes it or the girl who writes it, she don't have to think. Yeah. You can just write it. It's all feeling. Nobody, nobody's going to, you don't analyze it because that kills it. So you just write it. It's, mm -hmm. it's fun. So I'm going to read a poem and it's a little bit abstract. Sure. But you know, I like it. It's a wonder to my sight. <clears throat> I saw perfection's radiant form, a central burning circled shine, rings of creation spreading, forming, differences to hold the breath from speeding back unknown. I am this holding sound that speaks its wonder to my sight and declares a wholeness, as a point so small that eternity in flux will hide its nest inside, and all the gods and goddesses have found their space of play and stirring, pouring, happiness so loud that stillness can't resist, but shout and mix its knowledge to a soup, so grand that existence finds itself a causeway to creation's infinite arms, where the earth, body, soul, heaven, me, and God, all flexing knowledge, bliss, and joy, can go as oneness separate ways, forever joined a, se a geography of heaven's home. I alone and you alone, so close that every tiny thought, every quiet sense, tingles at God's open door. Nice. Yeah. Well, you know, it kind of conveys, you know, if only on the feeling level, what the, when you know, what, what, wakefulness can feel like or mm -hmm. can reach or go to you know it's like yeah, one thing I do like about the word enlightenment it does say enlightenment you right. know light it doesn't say in darkness meant <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean right. so there is that quality of wonder and 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 radiance and illumination and to the mature experience of awakening mm -hmm. so yeah I mean, even little old me, I, I sometimes have this this experience where I just feel lit up inside. Yeah. You know? and it's not like, well, and there's that classic saying, the you know, brilliance of a thousand suns or something. I haven't had anything of that nature, but there there is sometimes a f just a very palpable sense of um, somebody turned the lights on. You know, there's something lit up. That's right. There's some. Um even an experience like what I read, this poem, mm -hmm. I would have an experience like that, and I'd call that a flashy experience because it can't be there all the time because it couldn't drive a car or right. do anything if that, if that kind of experience was overshadowing you. Now, but that experience is in my, the knowledge structure of my mind and heart. I can describe it to you. I could tell you what every one of those lines means because I know and that's where the knowledge comes in and that's where the uh, understanding is such, I hate to use the word joy but I will, you know, <laughs> or fun even, you know, and um, <clears throat> but to a person who, let's say a person has that experience, um, the knowledge of that experience, the feeling of that experience, the depth of that experience all the time. You could say that's an awake mind. Mm -hmm. I keep using that word. You know, I don't, I don't claim to be enlightened. <laughs> I don't because it doesn't feel like I'm in any special state. It never has felt that way. But I ha the only reason I can describe this stuff 
that I can describe and I'll go into more. <clears throat> I'm way too dumb to make this stuff up. You can't make it up. You know, it, yeah. you either see it, hear it, taste it and touch it, and you can describe it, or you can't. Well, you know, I remember some story about the Buddha where someone asked him, what are you? Are you a god? Are you a... Uh, you know, a, a deva, or are you, are you in, uh, they, they asked him several things like that, and he just said, I'm awake, you know, so, I mean, I, he implied that it was normal for him, and it wasn't like, um, he wouldn't, he might not have said, I am enlightened either, he might have just. He wouldn't have said that, it's like, you know, it's like, if I'm going for a walk, how about I describe to you that I'm walking down the street, how stupid does that sound? <laughs> Do yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, to me, it. I, uh, what I do understand that <clears throat> that explaining the state or explaining these experiences helps people. You sure. know, I never thought that way. You know, I didn't. I never thought that I would start talking about this stuff. I just want. I've been writing for thirty or forty years. You know, about it because it's fun for me to do. So I write it down again. And you've been reading. I mean, and you've I've read re hundreds of spiritual books I have. because you've been yeah. trying to advance your own yeah, understanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And see how it compares with what other people have experienced. And... So you want to talk about heaven? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's let's start out by saying all this next section of talk about heaven and the devas or the gods or the angels or the archangels, all this stuff isn't something you have to have. It's not the awake state. It's not enlightenment. It, it's, it is, might be, be is part it of it. icing on the cake? So it's a little bit of icing on the yeah. cake. Um, and I firmly believe that you can, you can go from almost total ignorance to a state of complete wakefulness and not have too much experience in between. Mm -hmm. and, and you say, whoa, this is wonderful, I love it. I'm, what else is there? I think that's what most people do. And let me preface this okay. part of our discussion by saying that um, very few contemporary spiritual teachers talk about heavenly or celestial types of you know, things, realities, experiences. I don't think they're having them. Um, some are and don't want to talk about it. But I, I think most aren't. And sometimes when I have a guest on who mentions that stuff or I make some comment on the internet or something, a lot of people just sort of come back at me saying, ah, oh, that is just makyo. It's a Buddhist term for illusion. It's, it's sort of fascination with illusory, changing realms of, uh, and, and it's really not, you're not cutting to the quick. You're not shooting the, to the core of reality. You're, you're getting hung up in fanciful, you know, fluff. <laughs> well, uh, so yeah, I, I don't yeah, yeah. feel that way. I think it's part of the territory and, and that of a fully mature spiritual development either of a person or of a society would include familiarity with all that. But it's definitely a little bit on the cutting edge right now of what people experience and talk about. Okay, so... But I, st but I want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so a preface before I go into that, by just quickly going through um, what I experience. And mm -hmm. I fully agree that all those kind of experiences are one of the layers of consciousness that can be experienced, along with pure consciousness, lively pure consciousness, knowingness, uh, the knowledge level of consciousness. And the site of that knowledge level of consciousness would be the divine levels. In, in India, it's called the Ved. You know, and there's personifications to those laws of nature. Okay, now, when you, when I first started experiencing, um, let's say, just say, celestial perception, um, I said, "What the heck is this?" Like I always do. <laughs> you know, I went through a period after I started meditating three or four years. All this stuff started flooding into my consciousness. Uh, whether I'm walking, talking, eating, whatever, and sleeping, there was this celestial perception. I felt like I was in a world of complete and total beauty, which was full of um, delightful experiences inside in the physiology, you know, and, and also I could see all this, uh, <laughs> you know, 
you sort of want to keep this kind of stuff a secret. You kind of feel like you're going to let something out of the bag you shouldn't be talking about. But I saw these devas and gods, and and you know, some were traditional, some weren't. But I didn't look at them in the sense how they were dressed or were they they were just there. They were wonderful. Now the great thing. I didn't know this at the time, but looking back on that, that lasted three years, and my wife did have to look after me a little bit more than usual because it was kind of overpowering. But those celestial perceptions did bring to light what's going on in my consciousness and what's actually going on in everybody's consciousness. And the way that it works, or the way that I see it, is that there's this pure unbounded consciousness, there's this liveliness, there's a knowledge and intelligence to that liveliness, and you begin to see it. I can hear that intelligence. And I say intelligence because it's specific. That intelligence has forms. Those forms, let's call them um, aspects of nature. You know, you, you know, in some societies, I believe it's in the Veda, they talk about you know all the different gods. Even in Christianity and oh. in Buddhism, they talk sure, about big layers. Sure, most of the ancient la traditions. Huge Native layers. Native American, of, you yes. know, South American, they all have. Since, yeah. and, and these levels and these devas and these gods, they all have specific functions and they're all connected to human beings. So I could see those connections. Now at that time, I, I can talk about it now because I understand it, but at that time I, they were all around me, over me. I was living in a world, in, the, in the, this, this tangible world and in this divine world at the same time. And, and these beings were not only out there, they were inside of me. Let me ask you a quick question here. Um, were, were you seeing them with your physical eyes such that if you had become blind for some reason you wouldn't be able to see them anymore? Or was there sort of an inner faculty that um, wasn't really dependent on Well, that's on a very good question eyes? because it yeah. was both. Okay. They, they looked like they were out there mm -hmm. everywhere, all up, down, around, everywhere. It was like I was walking through, I was in the movie. Mm -hmm. But I did recognize that there was a pure consciousness level at the same time. Sure. I could see that. They didn't overshadow that. No, and they didn't overshadow. I could still walk and drive a car. Mm -hmm. Just barely sometimes, but I could. <laughs> and I didn't have any accidents during those years. Right. <laughs> and, but what I saw was that that whole heavenly sphere or divine sphere, they, they have functions just like just like a, an architect who's building a certain kind of building or a, building a city, right? He plans it all out. Those laws of nature, you know, what are they? You know, uh, fire, water, air, and you know, all those things, uh, and earth. All of those things support our bodies, right? We can't, you can't see the sunlight, but it reveals everything, right? right. It reveals everything. You couldn't see this room without the sunlight coming in the, windows, correct? Mm -hmm. That's like pure consciousness. It reveals everything. Now, you can actually see, if your perception is clear enough, you can see what's going on. You can see these laws of nature. There's, there's personifications that are connected to these laws of nature, like, you know, an Indian, um, I almost said philosophy, but in, in Indian knowledge, they, they have names for these, Agni, Vishnu, you know, all these different. Mm -hmm. And I didn't relate to those in the sense that I saw those names. I just saw uh, they could have been Christian, they could have been Buddhist, they could have been anything. They could have been indigenous, Indian, whatever. Sure. They and were, actually, people, seers in many cultures may yeah. have seen the same things and given them different names and described That's exactly them slightly how differently. I, and so I saw them as principles of nature that have a personification. And they're, they're constantly active, uh, creating light, creating air, creating earth, creating the universe, creating uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. And my physiology was connected to that. Now, got any questions? Should yeah. <laughs> Let me try to give an explanation of what I understand to be the mechanics of this, and then have you improve upon it or, okay. or expand upon it. Um, I mean, 
you know, and we can take a scientific angle. Science, you know, science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Science tells us that when when we look at a thing, we're only seeing the kind of a surface value of it. And usually, science explains the the deeper values in terms of smaller molecular and atomic and subatomic and and so on. But um, but there's other ways of explaining it too. I mean, you, the electromagnetic spectrum, visible light is only a tiny bit of it. And then there's all kinds of other stuff. And and other animals might actually see other. Um, bats, for instance, or some other animals might see other phases of or f spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum. So, human perception is locked into a certain range ordinarily. Normal, yeah. Normally, yeah. And uh, but that obviously, even in terms of scientific understanding, doesn't comprise the totality of what's there. And so, what you're suggesting, alluding to, is that. And, and here we might switch from large to sm and small to gross and subtle, that uh, at the gross level of perception, concrete level of perception that most people operate, uh, we see certain things. But there are, are sort of subtler strata or dimensions which are um, beneath or beyond our ordinary range of experience. And human beings have the capacity to incorporate those ranges, to open to those ranges of experience. And every, people in every culture have reported having done so and having experienced various things Absolutely. W when they open to, the, to that. Yeah. And um, just one more point, and, 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 that, and what you're alluding to here is that these, uh, that, that the gross... I'm not, I'm not alluding, I'm What well, you're saying, <laughs> describing, uh, referring to, Sorry. is that the, yes. the gross emerges from the subtle or is based upon the subtle and that there's a, a subtle mechanics to the manifestation of the universe that these impulses of intelligence that you began to perceive are actively involved in and responsible That's beautiful. for. beautiful. You said it very clearly. Yeah. And I'm going to, you know, I write more clearly than I talk. So, uh -huh. so if, if anybody wants to know more about what I'm talking about, you're going to have to yeah. get this thing. It's pretty cheap, you know. I didn't put <laughs> a high price on it. Yeah. Okay, Heaven is Not in Heaven. Yes. That's the title of this chapter. Okay. And there's about five chapters on that in here. So what does heaven look like? Where is it? What does it have to do with us personally? Does awareness of its sublime radiance make it hard for us to appreciate normal life? There is no heaven without daily life and there is no daily life without heaven. Talking about heaven is just another more detailed way of talking about the subtle aspects of nature, earth, water, fire, air, and so forth, and how they relate to us and our planet, earth. Even though mostly unnoticed, the elements of nature are intimately connected to our consciousness, to say nothing of the effect of their influence as they get assimilated into all aspects of our lives. I experience pure, silent consciousness as an infinite, indescribable field of silent self-knowingness that is radiating golden light and energy like uncountable suns, superimposed and shimmering throughout this field, is a reverberating joy. This quiet joy is the awareness of the divine. The heavens are glorious. It's not for nothing that they are described as divine throughout the ages. The celestial heavens and their occupants are the organizers and administrators of the universal laws of nature. The process of how the material universe comes into existence can be experienced not only on the quietest level of consciousness, but on more active levels. Fortunately, this whole relationship and process is part and parcel of the experience or can be the experience of an awakened heart and mind. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we said it in three ways there. And, you know, that's probably enough about heaven. Well, just one thing to add about okay. that is so, so the conclusion of that is that heaven is not just something you may go to after you die. Although yeah. It may be that also. That's right. But it's here now if you have the eyes to see it or the if your if your experience is open to that realm there are people on this earth perhaps you among them who are living in heaven and fully alive um, even if they're in a, a circumstance that may not appear so heavenly on the, on the surface value okay so since everything's coming out of the closet i will say and uh, 
There was a lady, I forget her name, okay. but she wrote a book about her experience in the concentra Nazi concentration camp, and she was having celestial experience yeah. under this horrific situation. Absolutely. So her body was going through hell, and the people around her were going through hell, but she was in this heavenly state. So just like pure consciousness, just like the knowledge level of pure consciousness, the divine levels of consciousness, I have it all the time. It's mm -hmm. just there. I can see them all the time, mm -hmm. see this, this process. So I'm walking through relative life, divine life, knowledge life, and, the, and pure unbounded silence all at the same time. So I can look from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top, one big <laughs> sight. And it's so normal, it's not funny. I laugh because there's a song by the group talk, <laughs> Talking Heads where they said, from the bottom to the top. Oh, to dear. The well, they're, well, hey, those guys are brilliant. <laughs> I had to meet them sometime. Uh, and you know, I get, you know what? When I, I read this book, you know, I open it on a chapter and say, well, my, you know, I have this feeling inside. I'd love to meet this guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, that's how normal it is. And that's a person who has habituated and had these experiences all their lives, absolutely thinks everybody has them up until the moment that person opens their mouth and says, I don't have that experience. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And you know, a funny thing is, yeah. I mean, maybe 500 years from now, or maybe even now. No, uh, maybe some, five some, years from five now. Five years from yeah. now, if some other civilization were to visit Earth and, and listen to this talk, they'd think, well, what's the big deal? You know, this is the way everybody experiences life. It's, it's just like, you know, um, you're kind of an outlier. It's a, you're, you're experiencing something that is not the norm, but could very well become the norm, perhaps sooner than we think, hopefully, and that may very, may very well be the norm on one of the trillions of other civilizations in this universe. It's getting a little out there, but yes. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, 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 there are trillions. I mean, yeah, well, they, that's they, what they, they say scientists say. They've now, now found there, there are at least two trillion galaxies in the known universe, and uh, if even if there's even one spiritually advanced civilization in each of those galaxies, that's trillions. And, and there's probably a lot more. Scientists, aren't they now even saying, the top scientists who are the thinking scientists, I think there's not one universe. Yeah, they're there? saying there could be uncountable universes. Yeah, uncountable. So, so it's kind of a big show. You, you asked me, you know, somebody um, asked you a question about, you know, I talked about the family mm -hmm. in, in relation to heaven before, and I was relating on one of our talks with mm -hmm. you how it feels more, it's like I have a family, and two, two daughters and a granddaughter and all that, and it's wonderful family, love them. The divine heavens and their occupants feel like an extended family. Just as much They're as like my normal brothers and sisters, brothers and, and sisters, and fathers and mothers, and um, you feel camaraderie with them or an affinity. And totally with them. normal and natural and happy that there's some communication. Mm. So, is there communication uh, in any kind of hey, Harry? Uh, how, t let, let me tell you about something. I mean, is, obviously, that's it's more, it's more superficial way of saying it. But is there sort of an actual back and forth? Yes, but exchange look, of information. Look what going we're on? doing here. There's, yeah. a, there's an exchange going on. It's natural. We're talking. We're having fun. Mm -hmm. It's like that. They're they're doing something. We're doing something specific here, mm -hmm. right? They're doing something specific but with their relationship to me. They're helping me. I'm helping them. You know. Yeah. Um, because we have a mutual friend, I think I won't name him because he's shy about this, but he says he experiences celestial beings all the time around people and stuff, angels. And he said, for the most part, he doesn't know what they're doing, uh, he just sees them. And once in a while, they'll actually say something to him, like, you know, they'll tell him not to do something or there'll be some immediate communication. But for the most part, they leave him alone, he leaves them alone, he just happens to know they're there. I, I have a feeling that with you, it's more interactive. It's interactive, but it's on the knowledge level. Because, okay, how, how to say this? Okay, so the deepest level of pure consciousness over time permeates the divine levels and your physical life, your normal life. And, and the knowledge level of your consciousness is now everywhere. So the divine level of consciousness is the same. It permeates the knowledge level and my regular life. They're all intermingled. And, the, and it's a knowledge-based phenomenon which has a sight and a sound to it. Mm -hmm. So the divine heavens are singing, uh, chanting, doing stuff. Yeah. They don't have time to have meetings like this. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they have a very specific function yeah. on the high, uh, from God 
all the way down, or if you want to call the absolute all the way down. You don't have to talk about God, but I do have a couple of chapters on God, too. We'll get to those. Do, yeah. you, f do you have a feeling that human beings evolve into becoming those beings, or is it just a whole different line of evolution or species that, you know, not linear? In the unlikely event that some years from now we have another one of these discussions, I will get into that. <laughs> no. <clears throat> okay. Okay. No problem. Yes. So a couple of years ago, uh, we took a vacation in the Bahamas, and I haven't been in uh, uh, that kind of environment for many, many years. And one of the things, you know, you go to the Bahamas, crystal clear water, you can see 20 feet down into the water. And, you know, we're swimming around, seeing all the coral, and, you know, it's just snorkeling. And, uh, and at one point I, saw, I thought, isn't this wonderful? You don't see the water at all. But that's the significant thing, because not seeing the water, you're seeing the fish and the coral, and, the, and you're seeing the relationship of the fish to the coral, they're, they're colored the same, they, they look like the birds and the flowers. You, you get this picture that it's all transparent. But the water's there, and the, these fish are swimming. They're flying through the water because you can't see them. You can't see the water. And it's just like celestial perception and pure consciousness. It's just, you can, but you can feel the warm water, you like it, it's wonderful, it's cool or warm, and it's like, it's like pure consciousness. Everything's swimming in pure consciousness, moving in pure consciousness, causing little ripples. That's when you see the water, when a, when a bigger fish goes through or a stingray goes or a turtle, <laughs> and suddenly you see the water shaking. That's like pure consciousness becoming alive. So I, I had that. I love the look of that and the feeling of that clear water. Mm. And it, it just gave me that sense, it's exactly like uh, walking through consciousness or having pure consciousness when you're doing something or doing a piece of art or walking on the street. It's delightful, but in a very, very quiet kind of a way. Not behind the scenes, but throughout everything you're doing, through the eyes everywhere, it's like clear, clear water you're seeing make a ripple ripple or ripple <laughs> nice yeah a nice metaphor yeah I, th I, I yeah. yeah yeah and you know I, I want to remind people that even though there's some poems in here most of them are very short <laughs> you know only five lines some people really like poems some people do I tend to space out on them unless, yeah. unless they're very literal like Robert Frost or something. yes yeah. okay okay since we're talking about divine kind of things here's two little you know, lots of people are seeking God or, or what they think, who they think God is or what they think God is. And, you know, it's, it's not particularly scientific when you talk about God, but there's a lot of people, oh, I'm not supposed to touch this thing, are heart, heartfelt and, and they, they, you know, they're on a spiritual path. Sure. And for a lot of people, God is a matter of believing or not believing something. Yes. It's, they don't really think of it in terms of experiencing or being able to verify the existence of God. Okay, so. Well, you have a couple of God spots. There's one I there. have another one There's there. There's God, too. Yeah, I know. Son of God. I know. Yeah. Son of God <laughs> and God, too. Well, I could start there. Okay. I can start there. Looking at the relationship of absolute consciousness to the further unfolding of that absolute consciousness, as odd as it might seem, I experienced the that there are two totally simultaneously, totally related absolute. One undifferentiated, pure abstraction, the other eternal, universal creation. I ask myself, they seem so different. How do they manage to maintain the true reality of their infinite sameness? I experience that I and all living beings, all together and independently, are the full expression of both abstract pure consciousness and its tangible manifestations. God, the almighty being spanning all realities, is the universal divinity of all joy and understanding, and is the absolute value of all eternal possibilities for human awareness. God, 
structured the human heart as his dwelling place on earth. I came upon his hiding place, so close, so inseparable from creation, so inseparable from my heart that the slight difference between God and me keeps the relationship of a complete, complete oneness personal and lively. God in my heart is a cascading tickle the size of universal existence. God bursts all the boundaries as silent delight, as unbounded love, blazing as the total intelligence of my realization of his, her creation. So quiet, so generally unnoticed on the outside, completely unrecognizable, serene, yet I am, we all are, wholeness personified, God personified. We are the divine being in a universe to personal unfolding that breathes and walks on earth. This encompassing divine tickle of awareness that has an exquisite form that encompasses my whole heart, my whole mind, and my whole body. I experience the very structure of my body as this flow of divine consciousness. I see and feel this flow of consciousness as inseparable from God. It is not just a unity which implies some small difference, but is more like a total oneness with itself, quantifying and establishing the Creator's existence as my awareness, as everyone's awareness. When I saw and realized that the Creator's purpose and Heaven's purpose are really my purpose and are personally and intimately connected to me through the elements of their activity, which are the very elements of nature, my, aware my awareness took on a divine, family-like richness. So, when I think of God, uh -huh. I, I think that, I, I've often said this lately, I, I, I feel like God is hiding in plain sight. That's um, a nice way to put it. Yeah. In other words, like, and I, I again resort to science to help to understand this, but if we look at anything closely enough, we s w things which we ordinarily take for granted, um, ordinary everyday things like these little artificial flowers, <laughs> they're artificial. Um, <laughs> you shouldn't have said that, I, I can't that. see that. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, on a, on a molecular or an atomic level, we see this marvelous structure, you know, yeah, yeah, and absolutely. it's so intelligent and it's so perfect, or, or a single cell in our body, or just take a little cubic centimeter of space and, and all the sort of, the, you know, fluctuations of the electromagnetic field going through that or in that. And so, like, wherever you look, large, small, in, you know, here, far, there's this, there's intelligence operative. Absolutely. And so that, that, like, is tantamount to saying that God is omnipresent, that, that intelligence is omnipresent. And, you know, the, the word God has so much baggage so that people don't want to use it usually, but that's what, that's what the word really alludes to, is this sort of ubiquitous, all-pervading intelligence. And you were talking earlier about, um, you know, devas and God, uh, devas and individual gods with a small g perhaps, um, kind of... Um, serving a function in the um, governance of, of the universe. That's right. So I guess the question is, are all those things just, um, since God is on the present, all pervading, would we consider those, those and also us, our gross forms even, to be just part and parcel of God, different like cells in God's body, so to speak? I don't like to think of it as cells because, you know, you're mentioning these petals. Mm -hmm. Well, this pedal is not the same as this pedal and not this. So you can't find another pedal in the universe that would match this pedal exactly. Well, that's true of the cells in your body as well. You that, have like that's what I'm saying. many trillions of cells. Each so one with, is slightly different. So without these differences, you don't have wholeness. Without mm -hmm. these differences, you don't have God. Without these differences, you don't have knowledge. You don't have life. You can't breathe. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I will never be the same, even though fundamentally we have this uh, similar experience of pure consciousness, mm -hmm. whether you admit it or not. Yeah, but we're talking about God here. Yes, yeah. but the, I'm making the point that yeah. God created these differences right. so that he, she, can be God. There's no God without creation, and there's no creation without God. Now, that doesn't mean um, we're a cell in the nature of God. We're, how could you put it? We're God to the degree that this physiology can be God, Yeah, like that. 
and that relationship is a relationship which can be uh, seen and lived and known. Would it be true to say that in some way, in some sense, there is only God? And it, we'll answer that before I respond, to, I mean, before I go on. I wouldn't say that. Because if you don't say that, then you're implying that there's something other than God. If the, if no, no, I'm not. There's both. Both what? <laughs> there's both. Something other than God and God. And, wait, hang on, other than God is why God exists, but God is that other too. Yeah, because if he weren't, then he wouldn't be omnipresent. Yes, and neither would creation itself. Like right. atoms are omnipresent, and yeah. cells are omnipresent, and, and they don't even have consciousness like you and I do. How do you, how do you think we're not omnipresent as well? Now, human consciousness is capable of so much more than is generally thought of. You know, and I don't really like to use the word God that much either. Just like you said, there's so much baggage to it. However, when I say the word God, I feel a connection. I see a connection. And, but it's not outside of me. And it's not inside of me. It's both. It's the fact that the wakefulness of the mind and heart is open to the influences of the universe and universal consciousness. There is such a thing as universal consciousness because the uh, universe came into existence. And you came into existence and there's a relationship. Why? Why is there a relationship? No, why did the universe come into existence? God wanted to have fun. No other reason. You know, it, it's, this is really silly, but you know, this table mm -hmm. is made out of wood, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that table was made in a factory somewhere. Somebody's consciousness devised that table. They used machinery that had metal in it and this and that. It was in a building, it was in some... And these materials came from a forest, you know, in the Devonian age created by the Cain dinosaurs or whatever. Well, no, this is wood, so it probably came from the Philippines or something. <laughs> no, no, at some point it, it's connected... Way back, genetically. Way, well, genetically, yeah. it, it had to be there. Those and trees came from ancient trees and so it came on. From, and all the way back, go back, go back, and, and then it comes all the way back to the world, and the world came from where? The stars, and stars came from where? They came from the rest of the universe. Where did this universe come from? The previous. This, this table mm -hmm. existed in the consciousness of the whoever started it. Hmm. Now, I mean, that's kind of abstract, but that's how I see it. Yeah. That's how I see everything. Every so, so in other words, one way of putting it is um, everything that exists or ever will exist um, existed in seed form. In seed form. Yeah. Yes. And then eventually sprouted into what it is, what it became. And you know, there, there's, there's sayings in spiritual or New Age circles, you know, nothing ever manifested. It's all... There's, and I, I believe that. It's true that. on some level. It's true. But I would like to add to that that the reason nothing ever manifested is because it's all been manifest forever. Hmm. Everything is already manifest. Now, that's the experience and it can't be described. Yeah. Do you have that experience? You have it. If you don't have that experience, it sounds silly. However, it doesn't sound any sillier than nothing. Yeah. You and I have had this debate. We've even alluded to this debate in previous interviews, and I don't know if we, <laughs> if we could take the rest of the interview with me trying to understand it. Um, it's not an understanding, yeah. unfortunately. It's, if your understanding and your experience are one experience, then, um, okay. Let's say uh, Venice was down the street there. Venice, Italy. Venice, uh -huh. Italy. And you're seeing it from a distance. Mm -hmm. Oh, look at it. It's beautiful, isn't it? Look at the sun shining on it. Then you go around a bend in the trees and nothing for a moment. Then you come come around the bend and you, you're a little close. Whoa, I see the individual spirals and buildings. I'm starting to see a little color. Then you get a little closer and get closer. Whoa, you know, you're starting to see more and more. and. That's like consciousness and closer and closer to this realization of the self on a cosmic level. And then you, then you get right up to Venice and you say, whoa, this is beautiful. Look at that building. Look at this. Look at that. Lots of detail. It's still Venice. Yeah. Now, some people might get lost in the beauty of Venice. Uh, a person whose mind is awake doesn't get it lost as they get closer to the uh, 
panorama of enlightenment. <laughs> okay, um, so now you go in the in, inside Venice, and maybe for a moment, for a while, you lose the whole city because you're looking at the street. Look at those that beautiful pottery. Look at those canals. Look at this. Look at that. You get for a moment, you might get lost, and then and then you remember, oh, I'm in Venice, and then you see the whole show. That's how you understand what consciousness can be. You see that a distance first, just pure consciousness, a glimpse. A tiny little shimmer of pure consciousness. You're way off, as it were, and you get closer. Boy, it wasn't just a shimmer. There's ten shimmers, and, and then you see it as a as a field, and maybe you see uh, maybe you see something in it. Maybe you start understanding that this field is somehow universal, and there's some connectedness to events in your environment, and then later in events in the far distance, and so forth. Yeah, like that. You know, there's some people who say either you're awake or you're not. It's, it's A, B, you know, on, off. And um, you and I have kind of covered this, but what, just, to, just to bring this up, since I, I often hear that, I think what you're saying is there are just, um, there's just layer after layer after layer, degree after degree after degree of greater familiarity with consciousness. It's not just a, an on, off thing. It's... Um, it's something that one can become more and more intimately familiar with for the rest of one's life, even if it's experienced very clearly already. Um, that, that the details that can emerge as that clarity continues to increase, have, there's no limit to that. That's exactly right. But I would add on to that: once you have it, you have it. Yeah. I, 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 you you have it. That's all, and you know it. And then that doesn't change. But uh, the clarity of the structure. And the, and the nature of your consciousness gets clearer and clearer, and everything kind of moves into it, as it were. Mm -hmm. and, and oneness develops. You know, often the word unity is used, right? And unity to me is a collection of parts, and you either see the parts or you don't. It's still unity. Quite frankly, it's more unity the more you see, not less. Mm -hmm. Even though you're seeing more parts, so to speak, you're also seeing more a, a larger whole. Or like it, like in the Bahamas, when when there's fifty fish swimming around you, you suddenly, whoa! I see the water now because it's shimmering and it's mm -hmm. shaking, and there's fifty fish. The fish reveal the water mm -hmm. just as much as the water revealed the fish, mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. There's a saying Maharishi used to say: "The world reveals Brahman." We referred to that in a previous yes, interview. Yes, and that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Okay. So okay. If, if we have a moment we here, do. you know, I brought this book for a reason. I know. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd just be sitting here twiddling our thumbs. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> let me see if if this other God one here is. You know, that gets kind of abstract. And yeah. You d you do start fidgeting a little bit when I'm reading this. Stuff. I have something <laughs> stuck in my tooth, but I'm not fidgeting. I, oh, okay. I, I really <laughs> like this stuff. Okay. And, um, <laughs> and, I, and I like that we're talking about God because okay. it's not something that I get to talk about that much with people because, again, it's not something that is so lively in everyone's experience. They, they more talk just in terms of self-realization or awakening, but not a lot of discussion of God from, okay. uh, from an experiential Okay, basis. so this is, this is kind of interesting. It's about as long as the last one, but mm -hmm. I'm going to start from there. I because won't fidget. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Becoming conscious of the Creator, okay? And this relates to an experience I had, so you'll, you'll hear it. There was an instant in time when the light of unbounded expansion flooded my entire consciousness. All other experiences dropped away. I did not feel any loss of experience or detail, but rather a shimmering kind of eternal knowingness filled universality. The wonderful sight and presence of God that I had been wholly devoted to, as if blinked out and was replaced by an all-consuming holistic knowingness and sight. My experience now pulsed as unbounded pre-knowledge, pre-everything as and within eternal space and time. Then, I thought, in this awakened, unified abstraction of my experience, surely there is a home for the presence and experience of a personal, universal God. This happened about 25, 30 years, 25 years ago. As self-awareness recognized more and more unboundedness, I began to perceive the play of consciousness in more and more expressed values within that awareness. This quiet objectification of awareness within my own boundless nature brought a clear and expanded knowledge 
of the universal creative process, its administrators and creators, a very different, more accessible, precise, and more infinite sight and experience of God's universal and personal presence that then became available. I began to perceive the underlying organizational structure of nature near, far, divine, and earthly in relation to my own activity. An expanded range of lively togetherness began to sparkle. Consciousness increased in clarity and gradually became the landscape of a totality in which all the experience, all my experience, percolates. Then the knowledge began to arise that God must also be found when must be found when all this expressed universality, this self-aware abstraction. Looking out from a concentrated center that was also clearly located everywhere, a new clarity in one grand sweep flooded my awareness and expanded in every direction. Then, at its greatest expansion and smallest contraction, it froze. While remembering my individual body of awareness within my cosmic body of awareness, I found creation in multiple layers engulfed within this integrated oneness of my own silent, blazing heart. From within the infinite, sparkling dynamism of my unobstructed experience, God, or the Absolute as Creator, was perceived as the shining togetherness of it all, central to all experience. The abstract, the abstraction of God became tangible. It goes on and on like that for, for a while. But so we were talking earlier about you know, was there a time when you could say that enlightenment or self-realization dawned, and you, you discussed that? Yes, well, that was this one of those. This the, would be... The time when God dawned. Yes. Yeah. This would be the time that you, a unified consciousness dawned that included the experience of God, that included the experience of unboundedness, and excluded the, uh, included the experience of... Uh, all knowing this. It was all together. This was more the unified experience that arose out of the God experience. Mm -hmm. Now, it's kind of interesting. There's quite a lot of chapters in here on um, working every day. You know, I, I, had, I had a factory for uh, mm -hmm. um, 25 years yeah. with noisy machinery pounding away all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was the designer and all that in the studio and all that, but I believe it certainly was for me. The louder the machine was, the quieter I was inside. I'm not saying you go out and stand beside a busy machine, but for me, all that activity helped create whatever I actually have now. I have to say that. There's no way around it. I wasn't in a retreat somewhere. I mean, I have been, but I was during these years, um, these, these, uh, subtle experiences were had while I was working and walking around in a factory. Yeah. I'm still working. I got two full-time jobs and you know, I'm not a spring chicken, you know. <laughs> I like activity. My daughter said, are you ever going to calm down? I said, yeah, if, you know, when the body can't move anymore, I'll calm down, but <laughs> not before that. Yeah. That was good to say that because, yeah. it, it, you know, that most people have jobs. And yeah, it's, everybody does. And some people might feel like, oh God, I can't get enlightened because I've got this stupid job. But, you know. Well, you started right. You said, oh God. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> No, it's, there's it's not an obstacle. There is, no, there's just um, things that push you towards the awakened state. Everything in life pushes you to it. That's what it's for. Every yeah. obstacle you have, every good experience you have, every so-called bad experience you have, they all push you where? It's to a better place than you want to get there. And knowledge is one of the ways, after you have some experience or even a little bit of experience, understanding and knowledge helps you get to the goal. Yeah. yeah. Would you say that both in individual and collective societal life, there really are no mistakes? Like everything that happens is, is sort of, can be seen as what needed to happen in order to further evolution? Yes and no. You'll find where, wherever I'm talking or writing or whatever, I'm always looking at both sides you know, the absolute and the relative. They seem so different from each other, right? So what you said, they sound so different from there's a bad experience, a good experience. The bad experience sounds bad. Understanding puts that uh, bad, so-called bad experience into perspective and 
and realizes maybe it wasn't so bad because time made it go away and, and look what I got out of it, yeah. right? So I agree with you mm -hmm. and also disagree, the good, th good and bad, but so-called bad experiences don't go anywhere. You know, waking, dreaming, sleeping, the three normal states of consciousness. Um, let's say you, boom, woke up right now. Where do you think they'd go? Have they got a place to go that isn't you? <laughs> You still they, have them. You still have them. You're going to go to sleep. Oh, well, you know, you'll be awake inside. And you're going to walk around. You're going to dream and you'll witness it or you'll be part of the dream and you'll know what's going on. Mm -hmm. So all these states of or these experiences of clear consciousness are additions. They're additions to your normal life. They don't eliminate waking state of con the the normal waking state of consciousness. Your eyes still see the cars and the tree. You're not going to suddenly walk into that tree out there. Yeah. No, just, I'm not suggesting. Anything. No, you're not. But I'm just making that point. That, right. That um, there are more states of consciousness than the normal states that you have. Say your five senses, they function together, right? And they they cooperate. So let's add a sixth sense and call it you know, a state of consciousness, let's like the seventh one and call it a state, and that's all they are. They're, they're additions to, now, they happen to be really nice and really good, and you want them, and you realize that once you have a stabilized, expanded experience, you pray it never goes away, but then you know it won't. <laughs> there's nowhere for it to go. And there's no way for your waking state, your regular waking state to go, your dream state, sleeping state, TC state, witnessing state, God consciousness. None of these states will ever go away. You already have seven states. You're only aware of three or four of them. <laughs> it's kind of, that's one way of looking at it, right? Yeah. There's this friend of mine, Timothy Conway, whom I've interviewed a couple times, who has this nice article where he talks about the three simultaneously but paradoxically different levels of reality where you know you have the ordinary level where there's problems in the world and diseases and all you know environmental things we have to deal with all that we can't just say it's an illusion and it has to be dealt with and then there's a more divine level where you could say everything's well and wisely put everything's divinely orchestrated everything's perfect just as it is and then you could say there's an even more fundamental level where nothing ever happened so there is nothing to consider and each one of those is true in its own dimension uh, but you can't take refuge in one or the other and say that's the whole story. You have that's to right. sort of take them all into account and function on all of them, all those levels simultaneously. Well, you use the word illusion, so you know that's that's a good jumping-off point. What you know, there's a chapter in <laughs> my book that says the illusion is the illusion, yeah. and illusion is a reality in the state of a mind that isn't awake, a heart that isn't expanded. Because, and the reason it's an illusion is because it's, you're not seeing the whole show. You're not seeing the whole show. You're only seeing part of the show. That's why it's an illusion. Once you have uh, pure consciousness established, the illusion goes away. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it, it doesn't disappear, but the knowledge of what you're looking at is no longer limited. You know what it is now. So it's not an illusionary experience because the relationship between you and your environment, what you're looking, seeing, tasting, and touching, is suddenly real. It's all more real, which is kind of interesting, not less real. Many people, at least I've heard this from a number of people, they, you know, they think enlightenment is this, you know, a fluff ball of pink foam, you know, <laughs> um, and suddenly the relative will look just, you know, just like hunky dory. Hunky dory, and it is because on the knowledge level, but it's also more concrete. You see it more clearly because you see it in relation to your subtle experience, your divine experience, and your knowledge experience, and you expand. That's all clear. One see through wholeness, right? Good. What else you got here? You keep, you, I, you, 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 you know, you ought to read this Plus book. Yeah, well, I did cover, cover. Plus you have all those notes, so. Oh yeah, there's plenty, don't worry. <laughs> I, I spent this morning taking these off. I had 60 of them. I said, uh. Harry, that's ridiculous. <laughs> okay, so. So the name of this chapter is Surprise. After going through various phases of developing consciousness from the silent witness that was experienced as separate from daily life 
to a more intimate and constant celestial awareness, and finally to a comprehensive unified awareness. I did not expect much else to happen. I was wrong. I began to notice that the unified as aspect of knowledge was experiencing previ that I was experiencing previously so abstract now began to have a tangible definition, sound and texture. How could this be? I had always thought that transcendental consciousness would be the field of a blissful, wakeful, shimmering abstraction pervaded by a vast sense of contentment and all-knowingness with very few details. Yet within the unity of my consciousness, a tiny intuition began whispering to me, look closer, look closer. I gradually realized that the ability to look, to see within the unity of self-awareness helped me to develop still further levels of understanding. It was then that I recognized the silence of consciousness is really the reverberations of universal intelligence, which is the fundamental value of my intelligence, everybody's intelligence. I saw that universal events and personal events are the same phenomenon. I began to hear the reverberations of my own consciousness as the seed values of the fundamental structures that are the building blocks of universal to personal consciousness. From the, huge ex from the huge expansion to the tiniest point, I am, we all are the sum total of it all. I now see that not only is my inner life the expression of a universality, universally conscious intelligence, but also that my heart, body, senses, environment are also smack in the middle of divine unfold. Now, you're supposed to keep reminding me to be practical, you know, are you doing that? I think so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I make all these high, highfalutin statements, and here I sit, looking like a normal, completely normal fellow. Uh, lots of people look much better than me, I'm much <laughs> younger, can jump higher, run faster, have more brains, think clearly, are scientific, you know. But that's, that's life. You that's know, their specialty. That's, that's their th specialty. That's their, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like you have all this knowledge of all these people that you've you know interviewed. So you have you have this overview of, you know from you know little consciousness to middle sized consciousness, big consciousness. You you see that and you understand it. So have you integrated that in your life? Uh, to some extent. I, I'm interviewing you now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I well, first of all, I don't claim to be able to evaluate anybody's level of consciousness. Yeah. There, are pe there are people I resonate more with than others, but, um, you know, who am I to say? But um, I also feel like uh, each week when I do an interview and prepare for one, um, there's, there's just another sort of uh, facet of enrichment that some, some new thing gets enlivened in. Yes. Me. You know, some some little angle that hadn't been enlivened, and you know, very very seldom do I interview anybody who uh, I feel like, oh, I've already done this type of person a dozen times because each one is fresh, and um, and each one enlivens something in my consciousness or in my brain yeah, or yeah. whatever. Yeah, no, that's great. And so it's a very evolutionary process for me. To do this. Yeah, that brings up the good point we, well, we, I think we touched on the other day, you know, there's that old saying, the teacher always gets more than the student. Yeah. But it's not, you know, I used to think of, well, what is this more that I'm getting from talking to people who know less than I do? Well, what you're really getting is a, on more on the heart level, on the, um, that you're doing something practical and, and what the, uh, the abstract, nature of life is will support you more now because you're actually more useful to your environment yeah we were talking <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah we took a walk in the yeah, woods uh, yeah, a couple yeah. days ago and and that's one of the points we, yeah, we yeah. both concurred on is that when you put yourself in the position of um, in some way uh, facilitating collective evolution or spiritual evolution for other people then um, the the powers that be, so to speak, you know, of the divine gives you more juice, you know, it, it sort of like um, helps to support your activities because you're serving a useful function. Yeah, and I, I really like your point about does growth ever stop? How can it, you know? And, and I think 
everybody has to think about this. You know, even though your body's growing older and maybe you can jump less, but in your mind, you can jump farther, fuller, richer. Sure. And at, at least that's been my experience. I couldn't have opened my mouth 20 years ago and okay. said half the things I'm saying, even though I had all the experience. Yeah, I mean, you and I had talks nearly 20 years ago. Yeah. And I think and all, there's, remember there's... all I basically said is, yeah, you asked me about, I remember you came into my studio at, you know, my business and, 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 and you said something like, you know, I'm interviewing all these enlightened people somewhere in unity or you said something yeah. like that and, and and i knew some of these people and i said if those people are somewhere where the heck am i <laughs> you know <laughs> you know because i knew what these people were yeah. and and you encouraged me to come out and talk about this mm -hmm. oh, i came out, i started yeah Did well yeah yeah and, it, and it, it's been really a lot of fun and um i've learned a lot yeah. Well, I have this friend, uh, Susanna Marie, that I interviewed with Adya Shanti a few uh -huh. weeks ago, and she has this thing that she calls the five-minute Buddha, where she'll give a meeting, yeah. and rather than her just talking to the people the whole time, she has everybody break up into little groups and then speak what they know, you know, to take, kind of take the, assume the teacher role. And because she, I think she feels the thing we were just saying, that it, it kind of enlivens something in you. and and builds your own confidence and, and kind of clears the channels for the flow of knowledge when you are uh, not just in a submissive or subservient role, but actually expressing yes. knowledge. Yeah. So there's another chapter in this book mm -hmm. that says death is the death of death. That sounds like a redundant one. <laughs> it, it's, it is redundant, but don't most people think that death is, you know, you pass on and, you know, even if you're religious, you go, to, you think you, you go, go somewhere, to, yeah. you go somewhere, but. Um, so what do you, what do you, you want to read that one or you want to just talk about what you say in it? I, you don't have it handy. What, no, what I, do you say in that chapter? Basically, you know, when a loved one passes, we'll always feel sadness and so mm -hmm. forth everybody well you know and and it seems to be inevitable for anybody whether you're awake or you're not awake whatever you are the body grows old and you move away it looks like you've disappeared yeah you know when my parents both of my parents died i in both cases i felt like kind of glad for them in a way and a little relief too somehow. yeah it was like they were suffering they were the they were really going through it yes. and uh, now and i didn't feel like their existence had ended like yes you know but that they must themselves be rejoicing in a newfound freedom but you have that understanding yeah that that life doesn't end and, right. and that's the chapter's just about that that life is eternal it keeps going on and mm -hmm. on and these these things that i'm talking about are are my experience and the future and the past, you know, they exist in a transition point in human consciousness, and you are the transition point, and you will always be the trans. And 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 the physical body dropping away is an expansion of consciousness too, mm -hmm. and uh, at least that's how I, I how I see it. Do you say anything about free will in this book? Oh yeah. I've covered everything. <laughs> I think I. Oh yeah, there's a chapter. That's a perennial debate. You know, people saying there is no free will. People saying there is free will. People saying it depends on your perspective. And here again, you know, I love saying this. It's both. It's always okay. So here's the spoke of here's a wheel, right? And God's in the center. Out here in the wheel, you, you're you're only connected to the the guys beside you. And you're going in there, you're going closer to the wheel, you know, analogies drum. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they don't say everything, but let's say as you're going closer, you have a little more connectedness to the, to the center of the wheel. As a consequence, you see this point, this point, so you see more and more. So it feels like free will more and more. Mm -hmm. And, okay, so you go further and further, and at some point you get very close to or in the center, at the hub of the wheel. Now at the hub of the wheel, you have infinite choices. You can go on this one, this one, this one, this one. Yeah. It feels like, looks like, tastes like. So you're not just stuck on one of the spokes. You're not stuck the, on one of the only spokes. Only that one possibility. You have one, all possibilities. You have all, so that is free will. Yeah. But free will does not mean you can change the you know laws of nature or yeah. God's creation because everybody has a karma, dharma, everything else. They're doing what they should be doing. You can't create a miracle and suddenly, oh, you're, you're awake now, man. Even God seems to need to res abide by his own laws. <laughs> well, of course he has to, because yeah. he made them. Uh -huh. He's not going to do anything. So. so at that point, though, if you're at the hub, 
aren't you one with God? And so is there any free will or is it just the divine will that's always really been running the show? I mean, are, is there still any individuality to be free in, uh, in, to any degree this from is, this the divine is, will? This is the crux of everything. Mm -hmm. You're never God. There's always some separation. Yeah. You, did you, hear, you, re, you heard what I said. Mm -hmm. You weren't listening completely, but you were trying to. <laughs> um, the, you, there's always separation and there's always unity. Mm -hmm. there's all, that's what makes infinity and eternity and a living reality is that you're not, if you were totally unified, there's nothing. It's zero. Okay? But you're not. You're not going to be God, God. You're going to be close to God in His domain. You're going to understand. You're going to see. You're going to do, do, do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a relationship. Relationship means here and here. Mm -hmm. Unity means here and here. All the different expressions in the in the Ved and Christian, uh, you know, writings and Buddhist writings, they say you will become one with God, but they don't mean you will become God, it means you'll know your relationship, you'll see it, and maybe you know, all your senses But there will, will be still be a you that has some valid, some distinction, volition. however subtle, from God itself, and that you will have some volition. Absolutely. You know, the tree's always going to be over there, and I'm going to be here. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, there's this whole thing about silence. I'm for silence. Silence is a good thing. <laughs> I don't have a problem with silence. I have a level of my consciousness, is, it's so silent I can't see into it. It's silent. There's nothing there. It's silent, 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 nothing there. Um, there's a layer, that's one way of putting it, there's a layer of my experience that vibrates. It's almost silent, but it, it vibrates. It has a shimmer to it. It has a sound to it. It's a, a, a kind of a, a hum or a roar or something. And it's, that's where my experience starts. The silence is there. I can intuit it as being under that. And it's universal. It's everywhere. But so is, is that. Is the silence, could you say the silence is actually prior to consciousness? It's not even consciousness, but it's some kind of. If it's pure, unbounded silence, it's prior to consciousness. Yeah, Nisargadatta talked about that yeah, too. There's nothing there. Yeah. It's zero. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean. It's non-existent, but it's not an experience. As soon as you have an experiencer or something within that silence that knows itself, that's, that's something. It's very subtle, but it's there. I can, I can see and At first, I could only kind of intuit it, but I can now see this vibration in consciousness. Mm. It's, it's very low-level frequency. <laughs> and it, it, you know, it's like a hum. Now, you, know, you talk about the hum of creation. It's not one hum. Everything is part of that. There's this layer, this, that, everything, all the way to our physical bodies, and, sure. and it's all part of this home of consciousness. All the frequencies get more complex yes, and they, diverse. Yes, and the frequencies get more complex and diverse until they don't. Once you see the connectedness of, say, the physical, uh, your physical body in relation to uh, subtler levels of creation, then the vibrations look the same. They're similar. Hmm. Okay, once a higher pitch and a lower pitch, but there's the other pitch that's under it that's less, and there's another pitch that's under it that's, and until you're at the primal uh, pitch that's almost silent. Om. 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 Silent. Om. <laughs> like that. Yeah. And, and it's all really, so I don't, you know, there's this whole Advaiti movement and non, I, I love them. There's nothing wrong with, I think it's great. It's, it's part of the process. Mm -hmm. If they didn't exist, if that movement didn't exist, you know, millions of people wouldn't get anything. They wouldn't understand stand where they're going. Yeah. And all I say is that um, an Advaiti might look at me and say, well, you know, that's all frou-frou stuff that you're talking about. Um, and in some ways I agree with them because uh, fundamental consciousness is fundamental, but my fundamental consciousness is, is not fundamental. It's, it's gone. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a great, big, massive oneness with a lot of pieces into oh, stuff going on stuff going on yeah. right does that make sense to you yeah um, here's something okay um, 
I just came back from the Science and Dual Non-Duality yes. Conference, yeah. and um, Deepak Chopra gave a talk there in which he he recounted a, a conversation that Albert Einstein had had with Rabindranath Tagore. Okay. And Tagore was arguing that um, you know we create the universe uh, by perceiving it. In other words, that the moon isn't there until we perceive it. And Einstein didn't like that idea, and he had trouble with quantum mechanics, too. He, he said, no, the moon's got to be there whether or not somebody's perceiving it. Um, and so it was this sort of philosophical conundrum that, to this day, people are arguing about. Um, it seems to me, I, I'm kind of with Einstein on this, not... <laughs> not okay. No, just, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, you, you weren't comparing yourself to Michelangelo. I'm not comparing myself to Einstein. But um, it seems to me that there are so many arguments in favor of things existing, whether or not there's anyone to perceive them. For, for instance, I mean, the universe had to evolve to uh, over billions of years to, to the point where there even could be anyone to perceive anything, because in the beginning it was all just gases and, you know, in a, and stars, you know, burning brightly and, and so on. And also, I mean, even if everybody in the world agreed that we're not going to look at the moon, <laughs> Uh, we'd still have tides that are caused by the moon. And, or, you know, it's been decades since astronauts flew around the dark side of the moon. But yes. if they did so today, they'd see the same craters there that they saw, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Mm. So it seems to me that if, it, even if individual perception uh, in some sense brings in things into being, there, there must be some, there's some kind of template of reality that exists irrespective of anybody experiencing it or not, that brings a, a kind of a, a, a shared reality to our experience. Yes, and we can get a little, uh, we can get even more abstract here for a moment mm -hmm. and a little bit, uh, which will sound philosophical. You know, remember that I said uh, something like, uh, it's not that uh, nothing exists, everything is eternal. So if everything is eternal, then the moon's always been there. This, but you're, so there's a little bit of truth on both sides again, like mm -hmm. there always is. Um, it go into uh, the physical sciences, they're saying universe after universe after universe, it's, you know, 12 billion years is only a fleck in time compared to other universes. So there never was a starting point. Right. And there's never an ending point. Yeah, this is a little bit philosophical here, but um, on the deepest level of my experience, I experience infinity and the absolute, and both of those terms tell me that everything exists and has always existed. And the only, what's missing is the ability to perceive that existence, or what part of that existence are you perceiving. Not that you're creating the moon, but you may not be seeing the moon. For you, it doesn't exist. Mm. For you as a person, it doesn't exist. Um, for somebody else, a scientist with a microscope, um, telescope was looking at that. At the same time, you're saying it doesn't exist. Now, there will be a time when the sun ex becomes a red giant and no, expands, no, 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 and the, no, moon, no, no. the moon gets melted into no, it. No, 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 Th that's where you're missing it. Okay. You can't have an absolute or an infinity or eternity if that happens. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll say this once and nobody will get it, and maybe <laughs> I don't get it either, but... <laughs> With all these universes coming and going, there was the sun was there 12 billion years ago, 24 billion years ago, 1,000 billion was there a billion, million times coming and going. You're thinking of it on a human time scale. No, no. It never, it's like a, it's like a movie. Sun, 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 a million times over. Eternity is not a length of time. It's eternity. Okay, we won't go any more into this because you ain't going to get it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this will be for our, our repeat interview 20 years from now. That's still exactly. Still alive. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll have to do that before. But yeah. yes, no, we, we'll get out of that now. That's enough. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, there's a lot of raised eyebrows out there right now, but it's something to think about. Okay. Here's... Um, While we're on these slightly more far out experiences, here's, this one's, you know, a wonderful panorama. Yeah. Okay. 
There was one where you, yeah. There's okay, one, which one? I forget. I, maybe this is one of the ones you marked where you sort of talked about celestial perception and God consciousness and all that. Maybe that's what this is. You, you go ahead. It's something like that here. Yeah. Okay. You know, I'm reading all the... I'm reading all the experiences, but there's a ton of stories in here. Yeah, there's all kinds of things. And, and I should have marked one or two of them. That's okay. There's yeah. like there's the, funny stories when you're the Funny kid, stories from when I'm a kid. Crazy things you did and everything. And, you know, pictures like that. My wife has, has yeah. hippies, you know, in we the old... We can put that up on the, uh, in the video. And we should, you know. At this spot. Let's do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So my experience... It's like looking at a wonderful panorama that goes on and on and on, one that I can appreciate and describe in the greatest details while my senses are simply delivering the information. I can describe the landscape of the Absolute in this simple way. I'm the same Absolute experiences and experiencer in the individual and in the universe, the same one who is doing the knowing, looking, enjoying, and processing with the clarified range of my heart, mind, and body. The landscape of the Absolute is awash with the heaven of my own awareness, my own bliss. I live and breathe in the landscape of the effulgent Absolute, an environment of conscious knowledge when even all, where even all empty space and differences are acknowledged and love for the unity and wholeness that they are. So that's about, you know, it's like you can't take relative life, you know, the physical universe and separate it from the divine universe or from or from the knowledge level of your own consciousness or from the absolute. They're all one interrelated, connected phenomenon of of universal consciousness and how it percolates as individual consciousness and how they're joined together. Yeah, where would the dividing line there be? There isn't you there can't where be where could you draw it? You can't draw right. it anywhere. Okay. It's like like the depth of the ocean. Yes. You know, where 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 is the line where it goes from shallow to deep? You know? Yeah, you could never find it. It's kinda of flowing yeah. and moving. <laughs> yes. That's beautiful. I experience the movements of my mind and body as all pervading from within an encompassing clarity. Just what you said. Mm -hmm. Everything is contained in this wonder that is absolute understanding, absolute hearing, and absolute sight. Wide open as this experience, I can discern the self shimmering absolute and the relative and the relationship between them. This relationship renders all differences unified. It closes all gaps. All of myself and the environment are characteristics of the absolute functioning as my consciousness. This awareness that contains both the unbounded absolute and the universal relative is the unbounded knower. It's my awareness, potentially everybody's awareness. This is not just a feeling or an abstract knowing. It is so tangible that even walking outside I can hear and see the interconnected structuring thickness of my own unified, unified consciousness. My understanding wakes up abstract experience, which is organized as sequentially perfect information, becomes real and practical. This, this, entire, this entirety, this absolute space, my space, is so subtle and also so obvious that it's certainly not just space, neither all relative nor all absolute. This lively infulgence, this all-encompassing awareness, contains at least, or at least defines the absolute as part and parcel of my own experience. I'm going to skip a little bit here. I experience a gloriously occupied heaven all around me, a heaven within heaven, right here, right now, in my heart. I say heaven within heaven because I can always locate this heaven within my heart, within my body. Yet when I look closer, the boundaries of my heart and body also extend all the way to encompass universal existence itself the heaven of all heavens. This memory sight of unboundedness is so clear that all memories partake of this one supreme memory that has always been present. I'm going to skip a little bit still. Pure stillness isn't there because I have wonderful thoughts or wonderful sights. It's there because within these experiences I am the reflected glory of infinity, my own unbounded self, and awake 
eternal abstraction, spilling its totality into smaller and smaller and larger and larger aspects myself. The happiness isn't there because I experience only a transcendent stillness. It's there because the togetherness and the sublime intimacy and beauty of all the workings of my consciousness. So, you know, how, how, how does a person relate all this kind of stuff to, you know, daily life, you know, going to work? That's well, a good question because when you read this, and yeah. actually when I read your book, it's like, whew, it's kind of thick. With, with this, <laughs> every, every little phrase is, needs unpacking and, and this, you know, every, yeah. It, it does seem a far cry from most people's daily lives. So should I, should I read this thing about going on this log down into the water? Well, you just tell the story. You know how you know what you said. Yeah. And how does that relate to what we're talking about? Yeah. Well, life is late. I think you might have told it in a previous interview, but I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Maybe I did. So, okay, so we're in this great big park in Canada. I'm 20, I know, I'm 18 years, 17 years old. I'm in high school. Mm -hmm. A bunch of buddies were camping way back in the, in the, in, in the, on a huge lake, a bunch of series of lakes. And, and um, so we're sitting on the top of a rock that slides into the, that slopes into the water uh, 50, 60 feet down there. And it's 60 degrees slant. And we're sitting on this log around the fire. It's not dark yet, it's still light. And, and of course, being who I am, I have the thought, you know, isn't this like a great toboggan? I could, I could slide down this hill on this log into the water. Uh -huh. And of course, it was me that had that thought. And, and that the other guy said, yeah, yeah, you do it, you do it. So, you know, it's four of us, we haul this log. It's, it's a heavy log, but it's not so heavy. It's about this thick, eight feet long. I'm so I'm sitting on the log, and, and so these guys push it off there, and it shoots so fast down this 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 angle. That I said, oh, first thing I know, this is stupid. What am I doing? And within seconds, I hit the water, freezing cold water. The log keeps going. I go into a daze, probably unconscious for a moment, and I'm floating under the water. The log has gone way down into the deep, and. Uh, and, and I open my eyes and I see all these silver stars floating to past, you know, in this slow motion kind of thing. And, and I realize my coins are falling out of my, you know, pockets, my, and, and I'm seeing this, and I said, wait a minute, I can't breathe, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> you know, I'm under, and so I scramble to the surface, and as I'm doing that, the log shoots by me from the depths, because it was heavier, it went much deeper, and it comes back up, whoosh, misses me by what, this much? And you know, I, I stagger out from the water and I look at the guys up there and they, they're all, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I go back up. But my point is that, first of all, you know, after that, I never did that again, yeah. ever. But I did get something out of it. You know, when, when I was under the water, I didn't even write this in it, but when I was under the water, I wasn't unconscious, I was conscious. And I was still so young, I didn't know it, but I knew that something had transformed. I'm, I'm not suggesting anybody in their right mind do that. The reason I put, there's a lot of stories like that in there, and the reason I put them in there to show that any fool can have this, these experiences I'm talking about. I'm, I'm not special that way. So here I am, 18, 17 years old, having these crazy experiences, and starting to have celestial perception as well. They go almost hand in hand, and here's this crazy experience, here's this celestial experience or a unity experience or whatever. They're this far apart, okay? I'm okay, even younger. I'm a kid. I have pure consciousness, and here I am today. There's this the same pure consciousness there, same pure consciousness there, but all these layers are in there. So the consciousness and understanding I have now is so much bigger. That log experience is one of those experiences in there. So are you saying that, um, you know, one can have an inner wisdom dawn, uh, but it doesn't necessarily prevent you from acting like an idiot if, <laughs> if you're, you know, 17 years old and, and your judgment is poor because you're not that mature? Yes. Yeah. That's is that I'm, the main point of the that's, story? That's the main point of the story. 
and and the other point is that you are on you are on this earth to go through experiences and, yeah. and some people go through dramatic experiences some people don't go through such but all of us have uh, ups and downs and those ups and downs are they kind of rubbing us the right way yeah and what I would also conclude from that experience uh, and I've had some experiences like that in my own life too is that life is a precious gift Yes. And um, there have been a number of times <laughs> yes. when I've been in some kind of a dangerous situation, uh, you know, up on some cliff or something, you know, oh, yeah. not knowing what I'm doing. And, and this, it's almost like a voice comes to me that says, this is not what you're meant to be doing with your body. You know, it's like, be careful. Well, that's, that's what I thought. Because is, life is really precious and the opportunity for evolution in life is, is really so grand. And you really don't want to maim or you know, cripple or kill yourself doing something. I kept doing those kind of things for another thing. <laughs> but but I survived and and you know I never advocate that kind of stuff. But the main reason I put those stories, some of them are fun mm -hmm. but just to show, you know, I'm just yeah. a normal person. I think that goes for drugs too. It's like the moral of the drug situation is be careful. You know, there's a lot of people who are experimenting with ayahuasca and so on, and some people are getting good results from it. But, you know, it's like you, you got to, I'm not saying that nobody should do that, but safety first would be a good motto to live by. I think so, for sure. Read last, it says. Are we Is that getting, what your little note says? That's what it says. Read yeah, last. we've been going on for a while. We should probably are we getting get close? close to wrapping it up. Okay, so... Yeah, let's do a summary, but let me read this. Mm -hmm. This kind of, you know, I, I'm naturally attracted to the bigger experiences, mm -hmm. and that's why I must say my wife had a influence on me putting in some of the, my smaller experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's a nice experience, mm -hmm. the parlor stove experience. Wood stove, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. And the gap through the trees. Um, <laughs> Okay, okay. got to keep changing my glasses here, folks. Sorry. And the awareness is a cosmic map. Experience, I experience my basic consciousness very much like a map or a detailed organizational chart that shows, even at a glance, the structure of inside to outside experience. This map of consciousness looks just like a printed map in, in that the sections define just one separate expanse of a perfectly interconnected continuum of information. When looking at even one section of the map of awareness within the wholeness of consciousness, it is perfectly clear that nothing can be taken away without affecting the whole. My physical sense has this wonderful quality that it is uninterruptedly pure consciousness, that nothing has been left out of the natural layered connectedness of my unified experience. This map of consciousness is what I have been describing over the years and in this book. The unbounded knowing this component of my awareness is the ground state of all the subsequent concrete values of expressed naturally arising within my infinity of consciousness. My experience is not just intellectual. I'm not just that smart. My experience is based solely on my ability to absorb. When I can actually see the knowledge component of my own consciousness reverberating within my heart and mind as the gloriously occupied heavens, every bit as universe, universal as underlying pure knowledge, knowledge then I can describe that. All around me in daily life I observe and I can hear a vast space full of divine activity and the unity of cosmic configurations displayed as my own experience. The experience of pure consciousness is so subtle and so natural as to be almost indescribable and yet it becomes so clear as to be obvious. Excuse me. So knowledge-filled, bliss-filled, body-filled, divinity-filled, that one could not possibly mix it. Whole, wholeness has the absolute as its nature. My mind as its no, a lively knowledge, my heart as its bliss, my senses as its expanded nature, and my body as, a, as its eternal existence. 
Now, that goes on for a while, so, but I thought I'd stop because it, it's kind of abstract. And you know, I'm trying very hard to tr be a little bit practical about this mm -hmm. stuff. And, but to me, all these experiences that I've read and related, they're, they're within my normal life. They're within my normal sight. They're within my normal touch within my normal understanding and everybody can have that kind of normal experience. Now, even, even a small glimmer of experience can have an understanding component to it. And understanding enlivens the glimmer to many glimmers. Many glimmers join together to be a sight. A sight uh, expands to become your daily life, like that. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? To Just that understanding and experience both um, enhance one another and, you know, one should um, pursue both simultaneously, I think, uh, through whatever means one can. Um, this whole show is something about gaining greater understanding and getting, getting everybody's perspective on this broad general topic of spiritual enfoldment. And, um, and I'm, I'm probably the prime beneficiary in terms of being able to talk to these people every week. But a lot of people, you know, write in to say that it's really had a profound impact on them listening to this, that, or the other person. Oh yeah. And um, so, you know, it's like the, the old saying that that to which you give your attention grows stronger in your life. And I, I think if a person feels called to, you know, um, spirituality to develop consciousness, develop enlightenment, awakening, whatever, just you know, keep on trucking, keep putting, keep, keep your tension there, you know, um, and one th thing after the other will unfold, you know, there's nothing, there's no, there's a verse in the Gita that says, um, no effort is lost and no obstacle exists, even a little of this Dharma removes great fear. So, um, I really don't think there are any obstacles, and by effort, if we mean by effort, just attention, giving your attention to this, then one thing will lead to the next and it'll just keep unfolding. You know, guys cannot understand in any way or in any style how, what having a baby is like, mm. okay? That's, that's a lady's domain. Now, writing a book felt to me as close as a guy might get to that experience because in a sense you made this entity and you know, incidentally, I've just had a grandchild, and I can't compare the two, of course, but there are similarities. And one of the similarities is that you, you've kind of got this thing that's now growing. People are reading it, they're calling you, and they're saying this is good, or hey, what are you, you're a crazy man, or whatever they're saying, <laughs> yeah. right? And it, it has a life of its own. You're no longer doing the book. The book is now doing you, in a sense. And, and so, I think that's my conclusion, and you know, it. I'm going to say the book's available on, yeah. you know, Amazon, Kindle, Nook, uh, wherever you want, and I hope you enjoy it. I enjoyed writing it, and thank you for having me. Uh, it's been great. And you're already several months pregnant with a new one. <laughs> I've, I've written a it's new book. It's the show. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, it does. You know, prosperity shows all over the place. <laughs> thank you, folks. I've had a good time. Yeah, and so th and I thank you all for listening or watching. This has gone a little long, but Harry and I are obviously enjoying ourselves. Um, let me just make my usual concluding remarks, mm -hmm. which is that this is an ongoing series. Um, you, it exists as an audio podcast as well as video. If you want to be notified of new ones, sign up for the email thing on batgap.com. Um, there's the donate button, which we appreciate, and explore the menus. You'll find a few other things. Um, so you'll probably be seeing more of Harry one of these days. But in any case, I'll be linking to his website and to his book and, and so on. And, and you can, uh, you know, you're fairly accessible. If people write you, you read. Oh, yeah. I, I've started answering in the last six months, you know, I have a blog and I have a website yeah. and a Facebook page and all that stuff. And I'm learning it, so excuse me if I push the wrong button once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, thanks for listening and watching. I hope you've enjoyed this and we'll see you next time. Thank you. It's great. Yeah.